Okay. Topic. During the recent pandemic, I made a number of presentations through Zoom meetings with the Chesapeake Bay Flag Association that showed how flags in general, and the American flag in particular, have been used in advertising, politics, and other aspects of daily life. I illustrated this through items from my various collections of flags, prints, ribbons, buttons, trade cards, postcards, patriotic textiles, and so on. And this presentation is an expanded version of one of them. I first got serious about studying flags in 1971 after discovering this beautiful hand-sewn 13-star flag at an antique shop in New Hampshire. The 12 stars in an ellipse with one central star is a rare design among antique flags. While trying to learn more about my flag, my research led me to Arthur Whitney Smith of the Flag Research Center, which was conveniently located in Winchester, Massachusetts, just a half hour drive from my home. It only took one phone call and Dr. Smith invited me to visit his home and office and bring my flag. He examined the flag and noted it was hand-sewn wool bunting was definitely antique and of some value. His encouragement fueled my interest in seeking out vintage flags to add to my collection. During subsequent visits, to Tree Edge Hill Road, Dr. Smith and I showed each other recent acquisitions and additions to our collections. Here, Whitney, at a good young age, uh, Whitney is holding a reproduction of the Fort Independence flag, flag supposedly flown from Castle Island in Boston Harbor in the late 18th century. He had commissioned the copies for sale as a fundraiser to support research activities of the Flag Research Center. Visiting the FRC was like going to flag heaven. Books, and flags, and charts filled his home. Whitney did have the advantage of being able to acquire entire collections of material from deceased European vexillologists because of his international travels. My small collection was limited to what I could find at antique shops and flea markets in coastal New England. But the upshot of this was that Whitney impressed upon me the need to learn from what I can collect, to understand what these primary sources could teach us. He wanted me to become a vexillologist, not just a vexillophilist. Another of those vex words that Whitney coined referred to flag collectors. Over the half century that I've been seeking antique flag books, flag charts, etc., I find the insights these artifacts can teach us about history, commerce, politics, war, communication, music, legends, leisure, and everyday life are fascinating. Unfortunately, I only have 20 minutes uh, for this time slot, so I need to select a single focus of flag collectibles today. And that area is naval and maritime artifacts and souvenirs. While I've documented many use of the stars and stripes, sailors from around the world handle flags of many nations, as we shall see. Flags in the sea have a strong connection. As soon as seafarers began to venture further away from their local shores, some means of recognition at a distance was necessary. Flags were a relatively simple means of establishing whether a ship was friend or foe, a merchant ship, naval vessel, or a pirate. In the earliest days of sail, dating back to ancient Greece, signal flags were used to communicate detailed messages from ship to ship. The first standardized set of flags representing the numbers 0 through 9 was developed in the early 18th century, and this greatly expanded the information that could be transmitted at a distance became a duty of sailors to know the various flags used at sea. This chart from 1911 shows signal, national flags, pilot flags, rank flags, colonial badges, yacht bridges, and so on. The scholarship and artwork on some of these flag charts was pretty impressive for the day. This series by Gale and Polden of the United Kingdom and those by Brown, Sun, and Ferguson were among the most accurate charts made. In addition to privately published charts, the major maritime nations published their own editions of the International Code of Signals, which, in addition to detailing the thousands of messages and locations that can be spelled out with just a handful of signal flags, always included a colored plate of flags agreed upon to represent the letters and numbers. This is from the British edition of 1924. Now, these signal books often included color plates of the flags used at sea by maritime nations. This is a really interesting way to review the changes in national flags over time. For example, the second plate shows the first short-lived flag of independent Georgia that followed the Russian Revolution. And the flags of Germany are also interesting to observe. Here we see the merchant flag and naval ensign of German Weimar Republic. Following World War I, Germans were very divided over what colors best represented them. And these flags show the compromise that was reached. The field is imperial, 
black, white, red, but a canton of black, red, gold is added. At sea, the sooner you can identify a ship's flags, the faster the information is transmitted. So telescopes were a necessity in the age of sail. A rarity among maritime telescopes are those which have a small flag charts incorporated into the leather sheath protecting the brass tube. The flags on this telescope indicate late 1890s, as the flags of Norway and Sweden give us the clue. Union mark is present in both countries' flags. But we also find colorful flag artwork that is not of a technical nature. Sheet music, printed in the early 1800s, included songs dedicated to sailors, as in Homeward Bound and Columbia, Gem of the Ocean. Let me take just a moment to focus on the flag of Homeward Bound. It documents an American sailor in his period uniform raising a flag with a very interesting arrangement of stars in the canton, including a large, six-pointed great star pattern. You'll note that the canton also rests on a red stripe. In Admiral George Preble's 1880 tome on flags, he wrote, quote, In 1835, flags with the Union resting on the red stripe were made at the Norfolk Navy Yard for all the vessels of war equipped at that station, and for many years thereafter. They were called by their quartermasters Norfolk War Flags because the Union rested on a, war, on a red or war stripe, end quote. I believe the Fort McHenry flag, or the Star Spangled Banner, is the most famous flag with the canton on the red stripe, and may be the origin of the war stripe legend. Not all vintage maritime sheet music artwork accurately teaches us so much about our flags, however. Here, the American flag has at least 22 stripes, and the Union Jack isn't a whole lot better. Because of the close relationship between flags and sea, Flags in maritime art are common. Unfortunately, I don't have the funds to own any marine paintings showing ships with flags flying or scrim scrimshaw, where a sailor has carved patriotic images on whale's teeth and bones. But I do have a couple of other types of sailor artwork. Because of their familiarity with flags, sailors would often incorporate them into the artwork they produced during the long, off-duty hours at sea. One of these forms of artwork are nowadays referred to as woolies. Woolies are fabric pictures made with the threads and scraps of fabric, perhaps even from scrap parts of flags, uniforms, or sails that were left over after repairs had been made. The size of woolies is usually on the order of 12 to 18 inches wide. They often contained an image of the ship they were sailing on, and these are the most prized. Unfortunately, for vexillologists, woolies that only contain flags are more modestly priced. This particular woolie is from the late 19th century as it features the flags of the various European powers, including the United Kingdom, Germany, France, and Russia, who were all on reasonably friendly terms at the time. It also has a portrait photograph in the center. While photos were relatively unusual in Woolies, they'd reappear later. This one includes a photo of a seated lady, very likely the mother of the sailor who created this piece. One can imagine the pride the boy had when he returned home and presented this gift to mom. These two woolies, with the American flag, may be from the World War I era, as the flag of Germany is missing from both. The motto, for liberty and freedom, point toward the ideals of the Allies against the Central Powers. Because the left woolie contains the flag of Iceland in red, white, and blue at the top, one could assume the sailor artist who created this one was either from Iceland, or that the diagonal crosses of the Union Jack were beyond his artistic talent. Now, the woolly on the right was clearly made up by a British tar from the Royal Navy, as it includes a Union Jack in the center, along with two white ensigns. The only problem dating this particular item is that it includes the flag of Sweden with the Union mark in the canton, which was removed from all flags of Sweden and Norway in 1905, so this would have been an anachronistic relic during World War I. Let's look at a few items that were made for sailors. For that, we go back to 1863, and America is in the middle of its civil war. In October, a fleet of Russian warships sail into New York Harbor. The U.S. and Russia had been on very good diplomatic terms, and both had recently declared an end to the practice of slavery. Tsar Alexander freed the serfs in 1861, and President Lincoln had issued the Emanci Emancipation Proclamation the following year. Americans in the North saw the visit as a strong show of support from the Russian Empire. 
most European monarchies didn't support the democracy in the United States and actually favored the Confederacy, if not for political reasons, then maybe because of the great quantities of cotton they produced. On, a, on November 5, 1863, New York City rolled out the red carpet for the visiting Russians, including hosting a magnificent ball catered by Delmonico's. It was named Soiree Russe. Among the lavish, lavish decorations for that ball were silk menus for each table showing an extensive list of appetizers, entrees, and desserts. There were two different versions of this menu, one showing the 34-star American flag on the outside, and the other with the St. Andrew's Cross ensign of the Russian Imperial Navy. These flag menus are three inches wide and nine inches long when not folded. At the Soiree Russe, these flag menus were supported by small wood flag staffs, and the participants were invited to take the menus with them as souvenirs. It doesn't appear that many were kept by Americans, as I have never found any other examples of these flag menus anywhere. After a long winter and spring, the Russian fleet set sail for home, but not before stopping in Boston, Massachusetts, for a farewell banquet hosted by the city government. Taking a cue from the New Yorkers, Boston also had a beautiful silk menu honoring the Russian fleet. It was a white ribbon with a colorful cartouche at the top of the seal of the city of Boston, flanked with the Russian standard of the Admiral of the Fleet and the American Stars and Stripes. As it turns out, the Russians' reason for sending the fleet to America were not so much for showing support for the Union side of the war, but it was that, so that Admiral Osovsky's fleet would not be frozen in over the winter. In the late 1800s, America recognized a need for having a navy of their own to defend our shores. This cigar box label with a patriotic eagle and Uncle Sam acknowledged our understanding of our new place in world affairs. The U.S. Navy was already making peacetime visits to foreign ports. This 1897 program with the 4th of July activities aboard the USS Olympia while in port at Yokohama, Japan, featured the U.S. Jack and Ensign of 45 stars. Less than a year later, the Olympia would be leading the fleet against the Spanish Navy in the Philippines. The brief Spanish-American War of 1898 was a significant event, as it was instrumental in making America a colonial power. The sinking of the battleship Maine and Havana Harbor gave President McKinley an excuse to declare war on Spain. Remember the Maine was a common theme of patriotic textile. There you go. These miniature 13 star flags include a portrait of U.S. Navy's Admiral Dewey and the battleship Maine, respectively. These could have been made to pin one's clothing to show support for our Navy's efforts. While the impact of newspaper headlines and yellow journalism on the declaration of war may have been exaggerated, print media certainly profited. Printing blocks with patriotic themes, including Admiral Dewey and his flagship Olympia, fueled public interest in the war. It was largely through its naval prowess that the U.S. acquired Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippine Islands, as well as securing independence for Cuba. And the bill's hyping war news featured these patriotic illustrations. There were even public campaigns to raise money to replace the destroyed battleship Maine. This certificate from the Los Angeles City Public Schools showed the ship prior to its destruction and a full-color graphic of the American flag. Commercial advertising exploited this swell of patriotism. The 45-star flag forms the background of the USS Maine in this soap advertisement. The U.S. Navy continued its growth into the 20th century. In the twilight of his administration, United States President Theodore Roosevelt dispatched 16 U.S. Navy battleships of the Atlantic Fleet on a worldwide voyage of circumnavigation from December 1907 to February 1909. The hulls were painted white, the Navy's peacetime color scheme, and decorated with gilded scroll work with a red, white, and blue banner on their bows. There are many souvenirs available to sailors of the Great White Fleet. I have souvenirs from three Pacific Ocean ports of call. The first, from August of 1908, was Sydney, Australia, where this postcard shows the American and Australian ensigns supporting the British Royal Coat of Arms, surrounded by the arms of the Australian states. Next, we sailed to the port of Amoy, China, for dinner for officers in October of 1908. It is now known as Xiamen. It has historically been an important trading port, and this paper and bamboo fan 
includes a menu of the dinner presented to American officers in the Great White Fleet. The flags featured are the 46-star American ensign and the national flag of China with a dragon on a field of imperial yellow. The next stop for the fleet was Japan, and the Japanese outdid themselves with the availability of souvenirs for visiting sailors. This postcard with a background of a 46-star flag was one of a series whereby the card to the right would have been complete, I'm sorry, would have completed the word welcome that starts on this card. The portrait is of Rear Admiral Sperry, who is also featured on this postcard, surrounded by the U.S. Ensign, the Admiral's positional flag, and the Japanese national flag and naval ensign. Sperry was Commander-in-Chief Battle Fleet from 1908 to 1909. Another postcard is a beautiful design showing a small view of Arashiyama near Kyoto, which is a nationally designated historic site and place of scenic beauty. One of my favorite items is this special ticket from the Japanese National Railway. This ticket allowed American sailors to travel to any number of sites around the country. The beautiful floral design on the inside of this folding ticket shows vignettes of Mount, Su Mount Fuji, and the Imperial Palace, certainly sites that any visitor would want to see. A few years ago, I was fortunate to acquire this 1908 welcome badge with a beautiful chrysanthemum design. Of course, the chrysanthemum was the Amon of the uh, Japanese royal family. The photo on the right shows an identical badge in the collection of the U.S. Naval Academy Museum in Annapolis. As was the case in many of these Japanese souvenirs, flags of both countries are featured. One of the favorite souvenirs of um, Japan purchased by visiting sailors were colorful silk embroideries featuring national emblems. The late vexillologist Holly Mattis referred to these as kokuntos. I think he used the right term. The definition of a kokunto is a, quote, decorated, a decorative quilted design in high relief worked through at least two layers of cloth by outlining the design in running stitch and padding it from the underside. And these embroideries were also popular with sailors from other countries visiting Japan. Here are two that were made for Norwegian and British visitors. You will note that both of these have fabric frames incorporated into the design so that a small photograph of the sailor or family members may be incorporated into the very decorative trifunto. They remain popular well into the 20th century. These two similar designs feature flags of the Allied nations early in World War I as the USA flag is absent, we can assume these were made in the 1914 to 1916 time frame before America's entry into the Great War. These two larger examples may have been custom made to order. They describe the crew's itinerary as including China, Japan, and the Philippine Islands. If you want one of these custom made today, you might inquire if Mr. Keen Nakoka's firm is still in business making embroidered goods and ladies' dresses. His business card features the Japanese naval ensign and a sample of the fine silk used in his shop. Well, that about wraps up the time we have tonight. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share my collection with you and hope you enjoy the presentation. I'll close with this cigar box label of a sailor taking a break in front of a 42-star flag with six-pointed stars with the Canton Rescue on a Red Stripe. This is very likely printed in Germany for use in the American market. The use of flags, especially the American flag in charts, menus, postcards, artwork, advertising, commemorative textiles, newspapers, even railroad tickets, cigar labels, show how integrated the flag was in the lives of Americans. I believe these show how intimately connected Americans were with their flag before state laws against desecration placed limitations on how the flag could be presented. But the flag is still out there. Thank you very much. I haven't seen any references on that uh, other than anecdotal ones, as you mentioned, but I do have an early British Red Ensign in my collection. It came from Maine, and I'm uh, suspicious that it might have been used, um, might have been captured from a Confederate vessel that was using that as a ruse of war. But uh, it is entirely hand sewn of uh, early British wool. So the, the early date means it's a very likely Civil War era. Thank you.